Hello, and welcome to Startup Stories with Scaleway, where we explore cutting edge startups around the world and how they leverage cloud computing technologies. I am your host, Ethan Pierce. Today's guest is George Mueller, founder of BAM Ticketing, a platform that combats ticket scalping and black markets through tamper proof digital tickets leveraging blockchain technology. Welcome, George. Hello, Ethan. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, and uh, I enjoyed our, our kind of pre-podcast chat, and I think we're going to have some good things to talk about. Uh, maybe to give our audience a little bit of context, I'd like to start with just your, your, your quick uh, 30 to 60 second uh, elevator pitch to kind of tell us what you do at BAM. Well, this, uh, this uh, can't go quick because it's a, it's a complicated market uh, in the end, um, but it's a completely broken market uh, at these times. Um, and I, I was surprised by the numbers by myself, but uh, automated bots buy on average 40% of all concert tickets. Uh, and therefore, no wonder that real fans struggle buying their tickets and uh, concerts are sold out within a blink of an eye. Uh, consequently, secondary markets like uh, Viagogo and StubHub are dominated to 90% by profession professional resellers aiming for high profits. They even start offering tickets there before the official sale for the concert started. And of course, our prices uh, there are highly inflated. Upmarks uh, of 50% uh, are, are considered a cheap ticket. Uh, for the Ed Sheeran, you would likely pay twice or threefold the price. Uh, but even when you find good and fair price tickets, the secondary market provider will charge you additionally 30% in fees for bringing together the professional ticket trader and the real fan. Uh, I keep it with the words of Sir Elton John commenting uh, the today's ticketing market. He said, I think it's extortionate and I think it's disgraceful. Uh, but even, even regulations uh, popping up all over the world are lacking real power in this, this online business in the end. Um, band ticketing, as I said, uses blockchain technology uh, uh, to change this for good. Uh, we issue temp-proof tickets, bringing any ticket fraud to an end. Um, our system is able to eliminate uh, any unwanted middleman, like automated bots or other ticket traders, not adding any value to the ticketing lifecycle. Uh, for the fans, this means higher availability uh, of tickets, easy and secure resale of tickets, and finally, fair prices. So that's... that's uh, the wrap up of uh, of uh, the ticketing story. Well, that's it. It's amazing how many layers there are there and how much extra cost is added for absolutely zero value when people could have just bought the tickets directly um, and, and been able to get them at the correct price in the beginning. It's amazing how 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 uh, corrupted that system has become by automation and, and professional players. I'm interested in the backstory of how this came to be. It's, it's, I'm always curious. There's always an anecdote or, or how founders met or, or where this idea came from. There's always something really uh, fun to learn about how it is th that brought you to wanting to create BAM Ticketing. Um, well, as a music lover, I, I attend concerts quite frequently. And I remember um, that that day in November, when I was working uh, at a large open plan office. Uh, it was five minutes to 10 and everybody was rushing to their laptops uh, and starting hitting constantly the F5 key. Uh, from time to time, somebody in, in front of you or from the very back shouted, yes. Uh, so they were the lucky ones getting to enter the order website to get tickets for Rammstein uh, concert here in Vienna. Uh, the others later <laughs> had to buy tickets and were swearing and cursing around because of the high prices. Um, right. So this is uh, when I started to think about, and um, I, I, I worked for the financial industry uh, and their blockchain, of course, was uh, is a big thing. Um, and so I kind of uh, matched this together. And uh, when you do some research on, on the web, you see that these ticketing issues are all over the media. Artists are standing up to fight for fair price tickets for their fans. Um, Elton John, Adele, uh, Mark Knopfler, Ed Sheeran, Metallica, you name them. Um, together, for example, they wrote an open letter uh, demanding secondary market control from the UK government. It's all over the media, bots, ticket fraud, and highly inflated prices at the cost of uh, the artists uh, and their fans. 
if you go to sports events, uh, this uh, doesn't get better at all. Um, for the Olympic Games, for example, in Beijing, uh, they found fake tickets worth uh, 50 million US dollars. Um, so this uh, this uh, this pushed me uh, to come up with uh, band ticketing and uh, find a solution there. I think that it's and it's I'm not surprised that the artists especially are, are united against this because it it means that, that they can't charge as much as they potentially could for a concert because they also know that there's going to be this added layer behind it that that's going to take the tickets even even more expensive and that people are still going to kind of blame them um you know it's it's probably not oh those those bots or those ticket scalpers that made me pay a thousand dollars for that concert it's oh madonna or ed Sheeran, you know look at them making a thousand bucks a ticket or what like i mean i'm i'm sure that there's an, an issue there for them as well as to want to make sure not only that, that that these tickets are accessible to as many of their fans um, at the right price, but that also for their reputation and their own economics, this this creates a, a pretty serious situation that they would want to fix. Well, where it, where it becomes uh, completely absurd is uh, when when they start selling the tickets before even the the, the primary market uh, uh, went online. So right. you could buy an Elton John ticket for for Wembley um, before the official sale started. Um, but already at an inflated price. <laughs> so. Right. So you know you've got the ticket, but you also know you've paid 50% or, or, or twice as much or, or whatever, but at least you know you've got the ticket. That's, um, yeah, that seems like there's all kinds of systems there that are broken if that's the way that people need to ensure that they can get in line uh, to get a ticket for, for things correctly. Uh, I'm curious about the technology behind this service and, and what you've built, uh, how it works, how you're able to um, solve this problem. Um, well, I start with the non-blockchain part um, because um, this um, this is uh, more more the scale way related. Um, we are implementing basically a microservices uh, architecture, um, and with this we get a highly maintainable and scalable system organized around the business capabilities like ticketing delivery options and payment services. Um, as part of, of our microservice, we integrate third-party services like uh, KYC processes uh, to issue real visitor personalized tickets. Uh, Ticketmaster um, had a lawsuit uh, lately um, because they were charging um, to transfer an already personalized ticket uh, to the new buyer of the ticket. So it, the ticket got resold and uh, um, they, they charged um, an additional fee for the second KYC process. Um, so with us, um, we, can, we can change this and uh, we can independently how many transfers are in between, um, the ticket will only become valid um, once somebody did a KYC with it. This could be the last person who has tickets uh, at hand. Um, and um, as a second bigger um, third party integration, we are integrating a digital health pass um, so patrons can prove, uh, for example, a negative COVID-19 test result along with the ticket. So it's only one scanning um, and you have to prove of both a valid ticket and a negative test result within the last 48 or 72 hours. Uh, in this context, of course, the personal data privacy is, uh, needs to be always preserved. Um, and with our services, uh, which are completely encrypted uh, data and we are using verifiable credentials, uh, we can, we can uh, preserve uh, data privacy there very good. Finally, our microservices communicate with, uh, with uh, the BAM multi-tenant blockchain network and both are deployed on, on separate Kubernetes clusters. Um, so that's that's the core architecture around our solution. Um, more inter interesting, of course, is, is is the blockchain thing where the whole business logic is uh, actually uh, situated. Yeah, and and so I'm curious, you know, about the business logic that's in, in the blockchain protocol, but also the fact that you know one of the first questions we might ask yourself when we think about something um, being when a solution like this is is, is leveraging a digital ledger. Um, we would be thinking about you know the transactions per second rate because many many blockchain protocols have a very low TPS and, and um, um, that could be an issue if you have a stadium full of, of people that are all trying to get their ticket scanned um, and you need to have the, the that rate be as high as possible to be able to 
you know, process live ticket validation um, quickly. And so I, can we talk a little bit more about the blockchain protocol and the stack that you've built there? Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, always when it comes uh, to blockchain applications, it becomes a matter of religion, which is closely related to this uh, transaction per second uh, topic. And the questions there are how, how public is your blockchain, how decentralized is your network, uh, and so on. Um, a common framework used uh, is Ethereum, uh, which can handle approximately 25 transactions per second at the moment. Um, um, Justin Bieber sold 20,000 tickets for his concert at Madison Square Garden uh, in 30 seconds. Uh, this translates in over 600 transactions per second needed to handle this. Uh, on Ethereum, currently impossible. Uh, and now imagine uh, you, you named it the, the stadium. Um, you're an usher at the Lazio Rome versus Juventus Turin game, checking the validity uh, at the entrance. Um, a group of tipsy to uh, completely drunk fans uh, uh, is approaching you, uh, handing over the tickets uh, while singing really loud already. Uh, imagine you scan the ticket and then ask them to stay quiet for 17 seconds until you know if their tickets are valid. Uh, these 17 seconds will feel like an eternity to you. Uh, but this is the time Ethereum actually uh, would need uh, to validate the tickets. If you, if you pay the, the, the gas fee um, that, uh, that your transactions uh, are passed through uh, first. Um, we are building a, a real dedicated blockchain network specifically tailored to the needs of the ticketing industry. Um, with our technology, we set up a fast and reliable clearing and settlement system, which covers all non-functional requirements like uh, high state of privacy, low latency, and high transactions per second. Um, this was also the, the core of our technical proof of concept. We wanted to be sure that we can build a ticketing system which fulfills these requirements we need for, for, for ticketing. So our, our secret sauce, no, that's um, super. our secret sauce um, to, to make a, a final sentence on this, we, our secret sauce, how we, we achieve this is uh, um, we, we tailor all transactions and decide transaction per transaction, which kind of um, speed is needed and which, which uh, security is needed. And then we do the trade-off between those two. And we use different uh, sharding um, um, techniques um, to speed up the network additionally. Oh, that's super interesting. And I think um, uh, that stack of technologies that is, is, is able to um, build a solution around a very specific transaction uh, type is exactly what's going to create, you know, over the past year, but moving forward the next two to three years, um, a lot more enterprise blockchain implementation because we're going to get away from, you know, not even just a question of whether or not we can approach the 50,000 TPS of, of the Visa system, but, but yeah, like you said, 17 seconds to, to validate uh, uh, the ticket um, on the Ethereum uh, blockchain just wouldn't work. Um, and then even if it was working, the gas prices, you know, I was looking at a, a $20 NFT yesterday and the gas price was 80 bucks. You know, it sounds kind of like the Justin Bieber concert ticket scenario all over again. You're paying more for the system than you are for the, the, the thing you're buying. Um, you know, that's that that can't last. Um, that has to get solved. So um, it's super interesting. So I, I, I We've already talked about a lot of ways that you distinguish yourself from your competition, um, just in the way that you're solving these problems. But I would love to hear from you. You know why? Um, what does make you different? Kind of what's the value add uh, that BAM brings to this ticketing um, uh, problem uh, beyond what we've already kind of talked about? And, and definitely more specifically, if if uh, uh, if a stadium or a concert venue or a platform that sells tickets. Uh, is, is listening to this podcast and, and wondering about working with you. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about what kind of companies um, you're looking for at this time uh, that, you know, to reach out to you so that you can work with them and help solve this problem. Um, uh, well, our, our potential clients, they are, there is a, a broad range. Um, of course, the, 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 like really the concerts, festivals, uh, sports events, um, those are the, the clients we are we are approaching at, in, in, at first because there we can really show the USPs and there we have the secondary market and uh, there you have the fake tickets. Um, 
Well, in Austria, we don't have that much fake ticket, but if you go to UK or, or Italy or, or France and Spain, um, you, you have those, those issues present there. Um, well, this uh, COVID uh, pandemic um, hit us, hit us uh, of course, as well, um, especially as a startup. Um, and there we decided to, well, not, let, let's not call it to pivot, but uh, we, we added the feature um, to our ticketing, which, uh, which brings us in the position that we can approach uh, customers uh, more quickly. Um, because we, we are implementing a, a digital health pass there. Um, and uh, this way we can, um, uh, we can approach small theaters, which don't have a secondary market, of course, but uh, they didn't need any online sales channel at the moment. Uh, and they never needed something like a seat map because, uh, well, it was free seating. Um, but now if they want to reopen and the small theaters will definitely reopen before any large concert um, with, a, of course, with a social distance seating, um, we can we can easily um, give them the tools to to open up. Um, so we are switching at the moment from from large scale um, live events to more the small events and giving them tools to really, really even during pandemic measures, um, open up again. Um, hmm. So it's a difficult time, but uh, we, um, I think we, no, I'm quite sure that we, we picked the right partner for this. Um, our partner is uh, working with this digital health pass, also with the uh, YATA, uh, with the international aviation um, ticket clearing um, and they they also won the uh, in in Germany to with another company to to uh, provide their the official digital health pass. So we are we are hmm. quite confident. I've actually covered the IATA um, digital health pass a couple times on my blockchain economy uh, show, and especially now that we're also seeing Air France and and British. Um, Emirates, Etihad, Singapore Airlines, they're all rolling out different uh, versions, um, but all of them are all connected in some way to the IATA uh, uh, um, or will be uh, in order to allow people based on either test results or vaccine status um, to be able to pull that information from the verifiable government sources, protect privacy in the meantime, uh, but then really integrate that into the travel process so that people can smoothly um, you know, check in and go through immigration and stuff like that and have a digital version of all that. That's brilliant that you're linking into that um, piece. I also find it fascinating that um, when we look at, you know, the travel industry, but also the live uh, entertainment space has been just devastated by um, the pandemic. And yet the story that I love here with you is that while there's been a, a one year bump in, in the activity that you could be doing, um, what we actually might see is that you will come out from this with an even larger market um, to address uh, than before, simply because all those large venues are going to still need your solution whenever they can go back to hosting matches and concerts and things like that. So your existing market share is still going to be there to take and to develop, but also all of these small venues that are going to want to make sure that they have social distancing, um, you know, seat maps in place, and, and like you mentioned, with the um, you know the, to tie in a more seamless um, uh, interaction with whatever that database is for digital health um, passporting and, and and things like that. Uh, that that's super interesting. I I live in Paris and and I I see the restaurants on my street, for example, that. Um, you know, the really big one on the corner has, has, has stayed closed for months because they decided not to do click and collect or, or to really kind of engage with that piece of it. And I can only imagine how much this, this you know, 60, 70 seat restaurant is, is losing um, in, in, in revenue. But yet, you know, a couple doors down, there's the little four table place that, that is, is gone onto a complete click and collect and delivery platform system that has, if it's not 10x, it's 20x, the, the volume of orders that they had before uh, the pandemic. And so, you know, it, it, uh, I feel for all the people whose businesses have been negatively affected by this in a way that they couldn't work around. But I'm also, I love this story here where in reality, it's also created a new revenue model, a new business to address, a new way for you to help um, people solve, solve these problems. I think that's really cool. 
um, this, you know, this is going to be super important. Everything contactless is, has, has been sped up, whether it's payments or click and collect or other things. So obviously, you know, we kind of already had the ticketless, uh, the contactless ticketing in most places or a lot of places with barcodes, but obviously that's going to go another step further now. Um, needing to make sure that, that seating is arranged correctly and then the people are, are protected because the people in the audience are, are uh, as healthy as we can potentially know uh, at that point in time. That's all brilliant and it's great that you're kind of rolling all that into your solution. So uh, we've kind of already covered this then as we, as we talk about the large venues and artists and, and platforms, but also now into smaller things. But I'm always interested to very clearly understand so that people who are listening to the podcast know uh, what kind of companies should call you? Who 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 should reach out to BAM? Who can reach out to BAM um, in terms of the size of business and the things they're doing, so that you can help them solve this problem? Um, well, it's it's um, in this case, it's not a matter of size um, um, because basically we can we can serve the the, the small and and uh, the large scale because our system is designed to integrate uh, basically with uh, with uh, also with our ticketing systems. Uh, we we could serve there as a as a as a third delivery option. Uh, so we have the physical ticket, um, you have uh, the PDF ticket or e-ticket, uh, and then you have fully digital ticket, which is easily transferable and and has all the digital um, add-ons uh, around it. Um, so, but I think we we can we can here in Austin, for example, we 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 provide the biggest value um, at the moment to museums. Um, because we quickly implemented um, a time slot ticketing um, there as well. And uh, most of our museums, um, they do not have any online ticketing. So they had an issue before at, uh, at their box office. They, they, there was a line, um, people waiting for, for a ticket. Um, and we can provide them with an online sales channel and even provide them with time slots. Um, so um, those are like almost ideal um, at the moment because we have a widget which is easily implemented. Um, it's it's three lines of codes. Uh, you can implement it even in the WordPress site uh, quite easily. Uh, and uh, we do all the clearing and settlement um, and uh, um, using our payment provider, we can even, even split the price and um, the payouts are almost instantly. Um, the, same, the same holds true for, for the small theaters. Uh, which uh, sold their tickets up to now um, per email or uh, via phone calls or or uh, or any other means. Um, so those kind of small venues which don't have an online sales um, channel at the moment are ideal. Those who have a ticketing system, um, of course, we can replace a ticketing system there um, if if they do not provide any any the social distance. Uh, uh, seating um, with a ticketing system. That's uh, that's also a good thing. Um, for festivals, um, I think we are an ideal candidate um, because we can we have a partner. We can provide even CE certified PCR tests along with the ticket uh, in 14 um, countries in Europe, um, and within 24 hours, you know your result, which is valid depending on the country for 48 or 72. Hours and uh, um, we link this to the ticket. So festival ticket along with the PCR test, which we send through our partner. So festivals are uh, ideal as well. Um, here in Austria, we have. I'm glad you brought up the two examples of, of museums and festivals because um, this idea of non-seated ticketing is also super important, and, and also because so much of that is outside um, on the at least on the festival side. The we might see festivals. Um, come back sooner, at least in limited size, not necessarily in huge size, just because at least it's outside. Uh, and even places like, um, you know, the museums here in, in Paris that have all shut down and the Louvre has just been on a uh, renovation, um, uh, a huge uh, project just because, you know, that they, they can't have people. So they're, they're, they're doing lots of work they couldn't do before. Uh, but once those things open back up, that's, that's very true. There's a lot of seat, there's a lot of access that's not necessarily seated. And that's super interesting to, to hear how you can address really all of those things. So I think that really will help pretty much anybody who has a ticketing um, or a ticketed activity to be able to reach out to you, um, whether it's small all the way up to huge, uh, and to look at how that they can integrate that. And so um, it kind of takes this, we talked about the tech at the beginning, we've kind of talked about um, now the, the value add and the use cases of, of, of how you can adapt this to different cases. 
Uh, I am interested then in the context of the startup program at Scaleway and working, um, uh, you know, being in a partnership with an infrastructure provider in the cloud computing space. Uh, what are what are your needs as a platform? Because you have, like you, you mentioned, you had all these microservices uh, that you're running, but you also have um, all of the the blockchain uh, protocol and nodes that are that are that are there as well. So when you look at a partner uh, in terms of like Scaleway, uh, what are your needs and expectations uh, for that kind of infrastructure? Uh, well, if you think about the decentralization uh, requirements on, on one hand and uh, scalability on, on the other hand, um, well, both of them um, are, are quite demanding uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, so even for our core network, we, we need like really um, powerful machines, uh, which we can quickly scale up. Um, for example, if we approach a new um, regulation area. Um, so we are now in, in the EU um, uh, covering GDPR when we move, I don't know, to the States. Um, uh, we need to set up there quite quickly a core network providing the security there um, to onboard uh, the different tenants. Um, so to us, um, it's very, very demanding um, for infrastructure. Um, and also, we, if we have um, customers who are, who are not so tech savvy, um, we can we can help them with a partner like Scale Whale to easily set up a node for them, um, so they can drive their own node in the network, uh, still have their their own ticketing data private, so nobody else sees it, but still keeping um, data integrity in in the network. So. Each tenant um, adds up to the network, um, of course, um, and for us, naturally, uh, of course, latency is, is, is important in the, in the network. So um, we need high performance um, on the machines, really power machines, and we need no, low latency. Um, when a customer decides to run his own node on his own premises or on his own uh, cloud infrastructure, um, then, um, of course, the security between between those two um, and the latency between those two um, is important as well. Um, so I'd, I would say those are the most important factors um, for, for cloud services in our case. Well, that's fantastic. And um, we don't always uh, automatically equate um, blockchain um, scale or, or protocols or, or networks or nodes to cloud computing. Um, and I think it's very interesting if you, for your explanation of how you, you're going to scale that out for your clients and to, to continue to provide the value to them by having, you know, by having this availability be high, by having the latency um, be low, by having the data be private. Um, obviously something super important when we talk about the sovereignty, uh, especially in Europe, of cloud computing um, services that are not American-based or linked. And so I think that, you know, with the GDPR issues and, and different things, that's also super important to be discussing. So, um, oh, that's really fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating subject. And you've already uh, talked about a tremendous amount of innovation that you guys have been doing over the past year already. So I, I hesitate to even ask what the next big steps are or what's in the pipeline, but I'm, um, I'm thinking you've already done so much cool stuff recently, but I'm guessing that the next year to two years have a lot of interesting things coming as well. What's, what's next for BAM? Uh, well, next is uh, next is uh, waiting till uh, till it's over, <laughs> uh, but not the ban, uh, the the pandemic situation, of course. Um, and uh, and well, I mentioned it before. There are some some add-ons we are we are uh, discussing um, to uh, to come up with uh, like micro insurances, which, which can be automated using blockchain technology as well, of course. Um, um, so we have the proof of ticket. Uh, you have to prove that uh, the, the patron did not attend the event. So this is a clear case for, for uh, a micro um, insurance for this ticket, uh, which is uh, then handled automatically. Um, and uh, loyalty programs is, is, is a big thing um, because uh, imagine you're selling one ticket um, and you can actually cover like almost three uh, loyalty programs. Um, well, imagine it's a jazz artist. Um, you can cover the loyalty pro program of the artist. Uh, you can cover the loyalty program of actually the organizer um, who organized the, the, the tour or even the single concert. And you can, uh, you can cover the loyalty program of the venue as well. Um, and all of them, they can, they can easily send a message to the ticket. None of them needs to know who this is in the end. 
they can just send a message to the ticket and say, okay, look, uh, uh, the artist could say, I, my next concert is, um, I don't know, in Paris, um, come and see me. Um, the organizer could say, okay, I have, uh, I have quite similar artists um, which, uh, which, uh, which are coming up with a concert. Um, well, buy a ticket there. Uh, and the venue could say, okay, we have, uh, we have a special, a special night there. Um, this artist is, will be uh, on stage again. Um, please come and see, uh, come to our venue. It's a free night. Um, so a loyalty program mm -hmm. uh, along with the ticketing um, is, of course, it's, uh, that's a huge thing. No, it's, that, those are those are brilliant examples. I think um, I think also the NFT place that we're in right now with non fungible tokens. A, a big piece of that is going to be around added value, that people who have that digital collectible have access to other things, other benefits, uh, maybe special seating uh, or access to buy a special uh, um, jersey or, or or whatever those things might happen to be. And I think um, once all these things become more and more digital, it's going to be really interesting how they how they all begin to enter. Uh, mingle and, and and connect and and that's gonna be really fun to see the the the, the stuff the, how this all gets planned out and I think we're only at the beginning um, of some really interesting innovation well that's that that's an important point that's um, uh, also with us that's uh, we think that the interoperability of uh, blockchain solutions will be which could be even bigger than a single solution because if you imagine uh, about having a, a digital euro um, uh, most likely, uh, it, it might be R three Corda, um, the the candidate for this. Um, uh, we we have a bridge bridging with with this framework, so we could most probably more easily integrate the digital euro uh, with our ticketing system um, than than anybody else. Um, so so we think that this interoperability of of different solutions is uh, is also really important. No, that's brilliant. Um, I won't get started on central bank digital currencies. That's a whole other place this can go. That's awesome. So uh, um, uh, we could probably go down all kinds of great rabbit holes and, and talk about all kinds of amazing things. Um, well, I look forward actually to that next discussion because I'm expecting, George, that there's going to be many more discussions that, of amazing things that you're building and growing at BAM and, and how this is all going to scale up, especially once we start to open up more and your solution begins to be used uh, by more and more venues and 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 the the need that is out there that's obvious right now but that become super important once people actually open up and and need to be able to do these things if they aren't already thinking ahead so i'm expecting lots of really cool uh news in scaling up bam uh this has been a great discussion i really appreciate uh your time george likewise ethan likewise so thank you for joining us for this episode of startup stories with scaleway if you are a startup that uses cloud computing resources, be sure to check out Scaleway Startup Program at scaleway.com. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform, and check out all of the previous episodes of the podcast. Again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. <music>